Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone who uh, has been able to join us this evening. Uh, I'm John Astbury. I'm the Assistant Curator in Architecture and Design at the Barbican. And today's event is the first event in the program, uh, the public program for How We Live Now. Uh, How We Live Now, just to give you a brief introduction for those who might not have seen it, um, it consists of a free installation in the Barbican's uh, foyers, a publication and this series of events. Uh, it's open until December the 23rd and there will be events uh, running throughout until then. Um, and using archival materials from the Matrix Feminist Design Cooperative, this project is about considering the ways in which the design of our environment affects us and uh, sort of the stereotypes and assumptions that uh, design is often based on uh, and who these assumptions exclude and how we might begin to challenge them. So today we're moving sort of away from that core material uh, relating to the matrix design cooperative that the installation is based on to consider uh, ideas of queer space, both in terms of uh, the types of spaces we might commonly associate with queer identities, as well as how queer critiques of space uh, can be applied more uh, broadly, particularly in domestic settings, to understand the constraints and potentials created by the spatial and societal structures that we interact with uh, every day. And I'm very pleased to introduce this evening uh, with us here to unpack this. Uh, we have Olivier Valorand and Katerina Bonnevere, who are joining us from Canada and Sweden, respectively. Um, to give you some brief intros, uh, Olivier Valorand is a professor at the University of Montreal in Canada and author of the recent book, Unplanned Visitors, Queering the Ethics and Aesthetics of Domestic Space, published, here it is, uh, published by McGill Queen's University Press. Uh, and Olivia is going to be in dialogue this evening with Katarina Bonnevere, who is a founding member of the Swedish art and architecture group Miket, which works at the intersection of queer and feminist perspectives across research, performance, publications, um, and more recently last year, they finished uh, Kepsen or The Ball Cap, uh, which is a site for dance and movement in southern Sweden. So they're each, starting with Olivier, going to give a um, short introduction to their work, and then they will engage in a dialogue, after which we will have um, some time for questions from the audience. So feel free to be um, adding those to the video uh, as they go along, and we can revisit them at the end. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Olivier Valorand. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so very much for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to talk about some of our, I think our questions more than, than really what, what we have to, any kind of answers. And I think we, we framed it in, in that way. And I'm gonna share a few slides. Uh, so I think they will show in a few seconds. Perfect. So we start with this blank screen as I say a few things. Um, let me just organize my screen. Okay, perfect. So, um, as I said, we imagine this as a discussion more than a straightforward talk uh, for a few reasons. One is that the questions are, I think, much more interesting and much more part of our work than any kind of uh, final answers. And I think that kind of fits with, with ideas about queer space, since queer is such an undeterminate uh, idea, um, but also because there's so much to say and, and, and it would be too brief of a time to, to kind of share there that. So I invite you to, if you want to learn more about, about kind of my research more generally, to, to see the book, book uh, that, that John just, just showed you. Uh, but also I'll be talking about questions of visibility. So I please, please encourage your public library to buy the book to, so, that, so that these ideas are, are visible as much as as, as possible. So, so um, I'll start first by kind of think a few words about how I came to think about the, these ideas. So uh, when I was growing up, often kind of when you're in kindergarten or school, you're, you're being asked to draw, draw your dream house. And for me, that dream house would always kind of be a, a glass box in the middle of a forest. So glass box in the middle of a forest, you can see outside, you can, you're, but you're also kind of protected. There's no one around you. And as I grew older, um, I kind of realized that some of these questions were also some of the things that I was interested in when thinking about queer domesticity, which is it was kind of that relation between public and, and, and private. 
But um, for many of you here, you know that when we start talking about glass houses and kind of glass box, um, it's something that it has been famously developed by many modernist architects, uh, including, for example, Philip Johnson here seen in his glass house. So even before I started architecture school, I kind of learned about these and, and I figured, oh, th there's something to, to go with what I, what I had in mind. Uh, but also a, a few years later, as I was starting to look for queer architects within history books, which is something that is very difficult to do, uh, I learned that Johnson was gay. So I was kind of, okay, this is, this is kind of a, a model. Today, 16 years after Johnson's death, it is still one of the first names that come up when talking about LGBT, LGBT figures in architecture, which is, is kind of um, not surprising, but at the same time, a bit depressing that he's always kind of the, the same name that, that come up. And there's a surprisingly important number of academic and general public texts that talk about the glass house understood as a queer space. Um, but also, as I kept reading about Johnson's life, I quickly learned that he had been supportive of anti-Semitic and fa fascist politics in the 1930s, uh, something that has been widely discussed in recent years in relation to his still very important work or presence in the architecture world, even if he has been dead for a decade and a half now. So how could I and others reconcile this, this need for LGBT models in architecture that Johnson offered with his politics and generally his privileged life that clashed with the inclusive and critical aspects of queer thinking. Um, that if we think about queer thinking as being kind of challenging to gender and sexual oppression that, that fits within kind of more broad power structures. How does kind of Philip Johnson's life as this powerful man and um, fits with this idea of reclaiming him as a gay, as a queer figure, uh, because of the, because of his house, for example, of some of the other spaces that he, that he designed. Um, whoops. As I continued my architectural studies, I also finally came in contact with more in-depth exploration of what queer space could mean. One of the most visible of the of the at the time that I was looking at this was Aaron Betsky's 1997 Queer Space, Architecture and Same-Sex Desire, which offered an intriguing look at the use of both domestic spaces and public spaces by non-heterosexual people. As a young gay man, I was excited by the discovery of this book, suddenly feeling like experiences similar to mine mattered and learning about histories that were not part of the history courses that I had attended. Yes, Betsky looked at huge mansions transformed by eccentric gay men that I had no, no dream of being able to, 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 to do at some point. But he also explored spaces that I never heard about in architecture schools, such as bars and parks, and kind of presented them as, as in continuity with the, these domestic spaces, which was quite, a, quite intriguing. However, as I reread the book, I increasingly grew unsatisfied. Was this really representative of experiences similar to mine? And did Betsky's account include the experience of my women and trans friends? Uh, the two pages depicted here obviously are not the whole book, but they are quite representative of the type of visual support to Betsky's book, uh, text. And also kind of looking very carefully at the text, I, I found only a few sentences about Julia Morgan and Elsie the Wolf. And that was all about, that was written about women basically in, in this book. Uh, tellingly so, the very last image in Betsky's book is the famous Turkish bath painting by Ayn. If Betsky uses it to represent a fem female-specific space, the painting is actually much more about the male gaze than it is about one women homosexuality or sexuality, in addition be to being clearly marked by a an Orientalist influence. So is this really about kind of showing a diversity of queer spaces, a diversity of queer domesticities? Not really. More recent and more critical practices, such as that of Scandinavian artist M. Green and Draxit, can often fall into a similar challenge of trying to present an inclusive view, inclusive view of core domesticity. So if M. Green and Draxit had loved, developed a very political body of work interested in power structures about class and gender, in their Gay House art, artist book, they present a fairly limited representation of young naked men in different spaces of their studio house, focusing much more on the visibility of gay men than in any critical representation of what is otherwise a very challenging spatial um, um, 
space, uh, dom domestic space. So it's a really interesting domestic space that they inhibit. But if you just look at these images, you, you have no clue about this. So there, there's kind of a, a limit to how they can represent this. Similarly, if magazines like Dwell now represent uh, same-sex couples, they often don't explicitly say that they are together and photograph and discuss the different bedrooms and their homes being of similar importance, downplaying the fact that the same-sex couples might share a room, as in this 2014 issue. But for knowing eyes, the message is clear. And yes, this visibility is important, and I would have loved to have these examples present in my education. But at the same time, are they that visible or acknowledged? This is why I from core critical investigations of domesticity in my research to continue exploring issues of visibility but also understand how others have questioned and challenged the normativity of architecture i research and analyze different critical projects such as the queer space exhibition at the storefront for art and architecture in 1994 which we see two projects here while the exhibition attempted to answer the the question of what was queer space through an exploration of both domestic and institutional spaces I found the ones focused on domesticity to, to be the most interesting. For example, Jorgen Mayer H. highlighted the tensions between publicness and privacy in domestic spaces with the use of thermosensitive paint applied on objects related to domesticity, while Mark Robbins and Benjamin Jenny collected images of gay and lesbian households to both make visible these households, but also to question assumptions about what queer domesticity can be. Uh, but also very interesting to me was how all of them, well, the, the, both Jorgen Mayer and Mark Robbins, for example, continue to explore these exhibition, uh, these issues beyond this, this exhibition. The same year, for example, Mark Robbins created House Rules, an exhibition at the Wexner Center in Columbus, Ohio, where he invited architects to collaborate with thinkers to design houses that explored how a range of social issues were impacting domesticity in the US in the 1990s. So looking at queer issues, but also at feminist issues, at Chicano and Latino, uh, Latinx issues, um, how uh, blackness in, in the US influenced the way that, that we live. So kind of all of the, these different uh, ideas were, were explored in there. Similarly, while well, Mayor H eventually started building permanent spaces rather than his early ephemeral experiments, he has continued to be interested in how self and collective identification intersect form. So, for example, when him, we discovered he was proud mostly of the fact that the space had immediately been used for protests and social gatherings, much more than the technical challenges that had been faced in building it. So it wasn't that interested in kind of what ended up being kind of technical aspects of this building, but really the fact that these same ideas that he had been exploring in these more critical projects at the beginning had, had kind of frame the space in the center of the city there. But beyond these critical discussions of queer space, going back to the inclusiveness of a queer understanding of space, this then ends up leading me to the challenges of visibility. For example, how many people here in attendance know Phyllis Bergby? A senior designer at Davis Brody and Associates in New York in the 1960s and early 1970s, she later opened her own practice. But in addition to being one of the few women practicing architecture in the US at the time, Bergby was also much engaged in lesbian activism. For example, co-editing the lesbian feminist anthology Amazon Expedition in 1973, at the same time she was starting her office. She was also one of the co-creators of the Women's School of Architecture and Planning, an important series of summer schools devoted to educating women about construction. Importantly, Bergby brought to the school her environmental fantasy workshops, we see an image here, in which participants were asked to imagine their ideal living environments by abandoning all constraints and preconceptions, sharing and recording their fantasies in drawn form, exploring how it was possible, possible to live in ways that were not designed by men for women. In the syllabus, Bergby asked why these women's ideas and opinions were important. The answer was, in short, because no one ever asked them. So you see here kind of these ideas about feminine, kind of a feminist space or a feminist way of looking at, at space is also kind of uh, supporting the same ideas that will later be taken up on by queer thinkers to kind of question what are some of these forms, these normative forms that shape the way that we live. 
Definitely. But why are Okay. more broadly, and I was presently surprised to see the poster to the right in the exhibition architecture itself and other postmodernization effects at the Canadian Center for Architecture two years ago. But strangely, it wasn't really put into much context about kind of how Bird B work uh, fitted within a kind of a broader uh, genealogy of, of queer thinking. Um, but it was still interesting to kind of see this being presented. It's also interesting to compare Berg's B experience to that of Jane Greenwood, named by Out as one of their Out 100 in 2017. Greenwood was one of the founding members in the 1990s of the New York-based Organization of Lesbian and Gay Designers, and later its president, but she often is often not mentioned in, in discussions of the organization. So again, kind of thinking about who is really visible when we talk about queer space. The out visibility is interesting in that regard. She has been socially engaged as a lesbian woman since the early 1990s and a senior partner in her firm since the, uh, 1993. But it is only recently that her firm's public relations team has pushed her to use this engagement as an advert advertising or marketing tool, a completely different experience to Berg Bees, uh, who, who was kind of facing challenges to get work because of that visibility. And while making visible figures like Burby and Greenwood is still very much needed, it also raises questions about who else should be made visible, especially when we think about queer domesticities. If it is difficult to find examples of major houses designed by or for queer people other than rich gay white men, doesn't that mean that we are not looking at the right place? That we might need to start paying attention to other spaces that we think domesticity in a more communal ways that challenge traditional architectural archives and history books. So you see here images that I found in the New York Times and the Huffington Post, but I couldn't really find any of those in more traditional architectural publications. And as trend scholar Lucas Crawford experienced last year when trying to publish an opinion piece about, queer, uh, about uh, the use of public restrooms by trans people in the Journal of Architectural Education, we need to carefully think about whom is this included in architectural criticism. Can we continue looking from a theoretically informed distance, or should we seek a close relation between the languages and forums used and the people for whom these spaces are built? So in all of my years thinking about these questions, one of the guiding lights has been Katerina Bonavier's uh, work. And so I'm, I'm really, 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 really happy to share the virtual floor today with her. And I'm looking forward to hear what she, she has to say to kind of continue that discussion after that. So Katarina, the floor is yours. Stop sharing. Thank you so much, Olivier. Oh, it's so fascinating, all these pictures. I want to ask uh, things about each and every one of them. Uh, all these beautiful, beautiful women you have up there. Uh, uh, I'm so happy to be here. It's such an honor to actually play a small part in this Matrix exhibition. Uh, of course, uh, the Matrix, the Feminist Design Cooperative has been one of my uh, great sources of inspiration. So I'm, I'm super honored to be here tonight and also to share the screen with you, Olivia. It's really, really fun that we've been invited to do this together. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the practice that I'm involved in today. I uh, thought that would be nice to have as a kind of uh, go into a little bit more detailing uh, what Mikke, the group I'm part of, is doing today. Uh, I am, uh, my departure, as you uh, mentioned, uh, comes from partly this, uh, this book that I wrote as my PhD. It's called Behind Straight Curtains Towards the Queer Feminist Theory of Architecture. And I published it in 2007. And of course, Aaron Betsky and the Queer Space book was also super important for me when I first started to research, like, what, what about queer and space? Where can I find that? And, uh, and uh, one of the main themes that he was talking about is that the idea of the closet and the closeted space. Uh, and uh, there are many people who have been critiquing the idea of the closet because it's such a static space and who is in the closet and you out someone of the closet and all that. And it's quite a 
you know, architecturally also a quite static space. And when I was doing my research, I found that in Sweden there was there was a saying in the 1950s that connected to uh, the lesbian bar uh, or club called Diana, Diana, uh, which was one of the first club spaces for uh, lesbian in Sweden. And they were saying that they were hiding behind the curtains. So that's one of the reasons why I then called my book Behind Straight Curtains. And the, the beautiful thing with the curtain is that they're actually moving. They're not so static as the closet. So you're actually, and that's also one of the foundational uh, reasons why uh, the term queer or the idea of queerness is such a, a, a continuous productive uh, idea for me because it is on the move. It is setting things in motion. Um, and uh, I've been doing, um, uh, now let's see. Now I want to present also my colleagues in Mycket before I continue. So I'm in a collaboration with uh, Therese Christiansson, who is an architect and artist, and with uh, Mariana Alva Silva, who is also an artist and a cabinet maker from Stark, but a designer as well. And we've been doing various kinds of uh, explorations uh, and since the beginning of our collaboration in 2012, uh, we have in different ways been working with reparative spaces, spaces of sharing and learning. Uh, we are often involved in large networks of people and we have generated a broad range of outcomes such as large scale theatrical productions, permanent public spaces, costume, details, art pieces, instruments, exhibitions, animations, performances, texts, and theory production, education, and lectures. So we're spanning a large field in what we do, but we share a common ground in our strive to practice out of a set of intersecting perspectives. And, uh, or entities, we could say. It's the queer perspectives, it's feminists, it's class aware, anti racists. And uh, uh, we have all, prior to our, the beginning of our collaboration, we had um, long standing interaction with students. And during that time, it pointed us towards an absence in the field of gender and space. And so we came together to show, not only to tell what a spatial, embodied and material artistic practice engaged with queer theory could achieve on a discursive, reflective, as well as hands-on material level. And we often uh, dig into historical reference materials. And here, Susan, I would like you to show uh, the first slide, please. Uh, it's also the slide we have been using to advertise this uh, event tonight. It's a map of the queer scene of Gothenburg between 1990 and 2000, approximately, for a 10 year period in time. Uh, Mycket, we had when we, we ventured into uh, research uh, about the, uh, the club scene. We wanted to look at the club scene as a space for uh, an important, significant space for uh, uh, embodied politics, especially in a queer perspective. And this research, we've been working on it for about nine years, and we've been um, going into lots of different situations. And tonight I wanted to show you one of the situations that we went into uh, with uh, during this project. And the, this, um, this research is an artistic research project that had been, uh, that was from the start or during a period of these nine years was uh, funded by the Swedish Research Council, which is kind of quite fantastic that we got uh, uh, public money to actually make full-scale enactment of significant nightclubs. Uh, so we became these club queens for uh, nine years doing this project uh, as a kind of performative queer method of doing research. And uh, um, the first, uh, oh no, one of the clubs uh, is actually a mapping of the entire scene of Gothenburg during this 10 year period. And it's also connected to a, 
a festival that used to run in Gothenburg uh, that was called, um, or it was a, a, a carnival that was run in Gothenburg. And we were asked to do a project in relation to this carnival, but we didn't see any overt queer uh, representation in this carnival that had been taking place for from the end of the 1980s to the mid 1990s. And that coincided also with a period in the, uh, in the city of Gothenburg with lots of hate crimes towards queer people. And there were like, the, the nightclubs were uh, firebombed, there were lots of hate crimes, of course, not only towards queers, there were also a lot of racist hate crimes and so on. And, and all these kind of um, also interacted with a, a huge, uh, at the time, illegal club scene. Uh, and what was so fantastic with the carnival that took place in Gothenburg during this 10 years time was that all these clubs, all this, this illegal club scene were on the streets for during that carnival. Uh, and we thought we also wanted to have been part of that because it was obviously not possible to have queer representation in the carnival. So we did a project where we created the carnival that we have, would have wanted to be. Uh, and the first thing we did was to map the different clubs that we could find. Uh, and so, of course, this map, it takes, takes you to all the different clubs that we could put our hands on. And now I want to show you a footage of the film that we created after the carnival that we uh, put together. So we created about 200 costumes and we invited a large uh, number of people and we made this huge uh, carnival uh, feast float on the streets of Gothenburg. And this was together with the international uh, Gibka, the uh, international biennial um, art show that is in Gothenburg. So this is the first part here is from the warm up of our uh, of our carnival, but we have cross cut this uh, our footage with original footage from the carnival in the in the beginning of the uh, 1990s. And we call this film history as we know it. We want we made this film to put things right because we wanted to have the queer representation there in the archive. Uh, and now we have put this film into the city archive of Gothenburg. So here, the, these images that is on right now, they're from the carnival that we put together, but we also made an effort to make them look like they were filmed with the VHS camera so that they would also go well together with the footage from the original carnival. And uh, it was quite an amazing event to take over the street like that. And we have gotten lots of uh, feedback post this event about how, how significant it was for the people who actually could dance in the street then 10 years or more than 10 years later. So this is from the original carnival. So we didn't really have 40,000 people in our carnival. We had about 200, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, and this, uh, this research into the, the dancing and the, the relationship between the dancing and the clubbing and the political and this, the sort of the idea that the, the nightclub might be in a queer context, it might be the only place like home, uh, has led us into a lot of uh, new projects. And I now want to show you another project that we uh, just finished, and it's also uh, some footage from it. So I want you, Susan, please, to play the next uh, video. Thank you. Uh, so this is uh, from a workshop we've been doing, and we're doing these workshops in Mikke that we call DIG, which means doing in group rather than do DIY. And in these DIGs, what we uh, this first one is called Dance Paint Workshop. And uh, we've been collaborating with a dance group in, a, in an area in southern Sweden called Roslet. And this is a grassroots movement, this dance group. And uh, to start to think about what they could have, what public space which could create together, we made this kind of uh, dance and paint workshops where we tried out two different sites for a permanent dance floor where this dance group could dance outside. So this is the first site we tried out. And here are some footage from that. And that's, uh, oh, every, anyone 
but it could join this workshop. And as you saw, just panning past there in the video, the kids that joined were kind of standing on the side with their dancing with the paint on their feet. And it was such a great way of actually uh, lowering the threshold of dancing together because the girls in the dance group, they're, they're pretty cool. So they have a lot of respect with them. But in this workshop, a lot of people uh, dare to dance and join because you, everyone looks silly with dancing with paint on their feet. The second uh, place that we tried out at Roslet was an existing uh, uh, construction. It was the stage. But it looked really, really unfestive. So we invited for a second workshop where we redecorated that stage box. And uh, again, we played music, they were dancing, and they were paint to redecorate. And as you can see on these pictures, they're mainly the, the young people of Roslet joined to, to redecorate. And this was a kind of a method that we introduced in the area that actually was taken up then by the tenant associations to redecorate a lot of abandoned places in Roslet. And here is the ball cap. So what we did then with the dance group was to create this enormous uh, ball cap, which has a dance floor underneath. And you can play the, your own music with your smartphone and choose what you want to hear. And this is a, a public space that's, um, that is specific in that it relates to the dance group, Mixed Dancers. It's their space. They have been really collaborating with us to, to decide how it should look like, the color and so on. Uh, but it is a public space for entire Roslet. So it's, uh, and it's one of the most uh, sort of radically public spaces that I've been to uh, because it's been used uh, in so many different ways. And that, the last part there was a footage from, from last spring because we were gonna make a huge inauguration party and of course, with COVID, we couldn't do that. But what we could do was to invite kids to help us de decorate the, uh, the dance space so they would kind of open it for the summer. And it was uh, pretty good in relation to COVID because as you can see, it was uh, open air and to dance outside, at least in, in smaller group, was, has been possible. So it was used all through last summer by the housing company Vetterhem, who is the housing company of this large area, uh, to have as a starting point to, to see what we could do to kind of uh, support the new uh, or support the culture that already exists on, on Roslet, but that actually uh, has a really uh, on the other side of that reputation. Um, there is, a, uh, I think there is an image now that I want to show. Yeah, I have two more images. So I'll just show you them quite quickly. Uh, please, Susan, there is an image from the barn. So I, want, I will now take you back to the, the work we did in Gothenburg uh, to create that carnival in Gothenburg. We were in our heartlands and our heartlands is the rural area in which we live. And there is a quite common divide that you put queer lives in the urban places and, and that it's almost impossible to live a queer life in, uh, in the rural. And there is this, as you probably all are aware of, that there is this common sort of knowledge. But in fact, what we found out is that it's, it's super queer where we are here, also in the countryside. Uh, but we've also been kind of colonizing the countryside, doing all our projects here and then showing them in an urban setting. So I wanted, to, I wanted to show you this picture just to start questioning that idea of where the queer domesticity actually takes place and who is invited to take place in that queer uh, space. Uh, this is an old sawmill that we uh, shared together with a, a small collective of eight people have this together and we've been using it as a meeting place, as a studio to work in and so on. And this is just to give you a quick example of of the collective that uh, the core collective that we was needed to stage the carnival in Gothenburg. And the last picture is taking you into uh, the project that we're working on right now. 
So if we were uh, club queens during our last uh, artistic research project, we now we become changelings. So we're challenging our inner trolls and we're turning to a folklore and uh, tales that comes from these areas where we have our heartlands. Uh, our lavender heartlands, I should say. And uh, we are working with garbage and things that are found in the ground here to start to see if we could uh, come um, uh, beyond what we already know to try to widen our imagination capacity. And this project is affiliated to Linnaeus University in, uh, in Beckwe. And it's also funded by the Swedish Research Council. It's a three-year project that we just departed on, so I cannot speak so much about it, but I just wanted to throw it in here also because we're opening up our queer lives towards the other creatures of this world. Thank you. So now I want to uh, get back into the discussion with Olivier. So, yeah, and I, I can maybe start with the, the first question since you, you kind of just talked about it. But, but um, uh, a lot of the so you've done work by yourself, but you've also done a lot of work with Naked and with other groups before that. So I'm thinking about the, the theme that we kind of add for today. So your place or mine. Uh, so there, there's kind of in a way some kind of confrontation in your place or mine. So the individual, like my individually versus your individually individuality. But you've also talked about how you kind of think about the doing it as a group and kind of so. So this idea of the domestic uh, of the, the collective, and thinking about also about kind of domesticity and and um, uh, which we often associate with something that is very kind of small scale private in a way kind of okay you think about the domestic as as you and a few very close people, but I, I want to hear your thoughts about kind of the collective this idea of of sharing the domestic of and and in the different projects that you've done so the club scene which was. In, in a way about domestic spaces. It wasn't about something that are kind of hidden from, from the, the public view, but at the same time, they were about this this, this celebrated experience. So, I'm, yeah, so I, basically I wanna, I wanna uh -huh. know why you, you need to think about or why you need to, you feel the need to work collectively, but also why you need, you think it's important to have this, this thinking about collective experiences. Uh -huh. Thank you, Olivia. I mean, that's such a such a fundamental question for us, so for me, in, but also for Mikke. And I think this the pandemic pandemic situation has really made my body long for that, like going into a bar and just like maybe touching another human being, like just getting that kind of, you know, the, the friendly crowd, the crowd that makes you feel who you are, that makes your desire pump and your like, the last start. I mean, the whole, those whole thing, that kind of energy you get from a crowd and that feeling of belonging, especially if you are uh, like many queer people like myself, been feeling you know, full of shame for being who I am, full of like uh, insecurities and vulnerabilities of, of spaces where I'm not right the space is then that where I am right and where I can try out my my uh, who I am. These spaces are super, super significant. And I think about these, the clubs that are like uh, public living rooms, like they are our homes and that's where we belong somehow. And, and I've been safer there than in my, you know, my biological family or, you know, things like that. Um, and also I'm thinking about like, these experiences that I've had in clubs, and that I shared that with Teresa and Mariana, and that's the reason why we started the Club Scene Project, um, because we, uh, I mean, to both have the desire to grow adult, become something else that, than what I came from, uh, and have a, a friendly crowd who can help you, you know, uh, support you in that, and how that crowd is also supported by the space and that speciality, which is the like the queer space, and it doesn't only exist in the in the container, in the walls, in the floors, but it doesn't only exist in the crowd either. It's the like the network of the crowd and the container and the event that takes place there. Um, I just also wanted to show you. I, I forgot to hold this up. It's um, a recent our recent publication with the club scene, 
And what we've been trying to do here is it's all of the acts that we put together and we've been trying to write this as kind of performance in writing. So we take the reader through the clubs. So they've written like a theatrical manuscript also to kind of show that this connection between the crowd and the container and the designed environment, how that kind of uh, creates the queer space and that you, you need the stewards of the space, you need the technicians of the space. Like here today, we have all these like support structures to be able to meet. So the architecture is nothing without the, those kind of support structures. And actually that brings me to my first question to you, Olivier, because I had a fantastic summer when I was 19 in Montreal. And I, I experienced some of my first super queer spaces in Montreal. It was in 18, no, 1989, I was 19, and I went to these fabulous clubs where there were drag queens, there were girls with girls, there were like, they were open all night, and then when it was, and the, the decorations were fantastic. You know, I had this uh, almost enigmatic summer in, uh, in Montreal, and I know you're in Montreal right now, and for me, that was an awakening, an early awakening into what a space could be, a queer space could be, and due to my body. And I wonder, what, did you have any, like, what, is, did, what are your spaces of awakening in relation to queerness? Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't know if there's any space. I, I, in, my, in my case, I, I kind of came to this idea of, of thinking about queerness and space. Um, from outside of architecture and from outside of space in a way. So, so I, I was kind of, as a teenager, I create, I created LGBT organization at my, my high schools. And then, so, so there was always kind of th this activist drive to, to, to what I wanted to do. So, and then in parallel, I had this kind of interest in architecture. So I, I went to architecture school and as I, I said, there was kind of this frustration that I couldn't bring those two things together. And that's where I kind of started thinking about, okay, what, what, what does it mean to bring the two? Um, uh, and kind of, I, I saw a lack of interest in, in, in gender and sexuality and, and architectural thinking. And that was really, really problematic for me. So then I started looking at, at the spaces I had been, I had been exploring clubs and bars and, 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 and kind of even the domestic spaces and the public spaces that I had been exploring and trying to figure out, okay, where do I fit within that? Where, why kind of, is it, is it about the, as you say, kind of the material space, aspects of these spaces or is it about the social lives of it? And then I, I, I kind of, um, I, yeah, I, I started thinking about um, the questions that come from the way that I had been taught about architecture, which was really kind of the technical and formal aspects of it. So you put walls this way, you put the windows this way to kind of have a great composition and it's kind of part of this and you can do it kind of in a more traditional looking way or a more modern way, but but it was really kind of very formal. And I I, I felt that that was very limiting. And, and then I kind of looked at, um, at, at what geographers had been kind of doing in terms of kind of looking at exploring something that they call space, but that for architects is kind of, we don't really use space in, in that word, in that sense, in the way that, that it was often very much more abstract than how we had our architects talk about space. So I, I tried to figure out, hey, what's, what's that connection between the two? So that's why I kind of often say that there's kind of this, the, this um, um, disconnection between kind of a, a somewhat abstract way of looking at it and the very embodied experience of, of these spaces. So I, I, you, you, I think the way that you've talked about it really comes from that experience of, of enjoying the space and kind of seeing it and living it and then trying to, to kind of reconcile it with the way that you, we think about architecture. And I, I think in my case, it kind of came from from a bit from the other way, but kind of saying, okay, no, but I've been living these spaces as embodied spaces. So how do I bring that back um, uh, into it? So, and that kind of led me to a lot of questions. So I ended up doing my a master's, master's research on gay bars because I, I was trying to figure out, okay, are gay bars kind of 
interesting spaces by them in themselves or are they just kind of commercial space that but, but as you say no i think they are much more than that they are spaces that we can think of as, as domestic spaces we can think of as kind of social spaces and the fact that we kind of ignore these kind of everyday spaces um in in a lot of our, our looks at, at architecture i think it's quite problematic because that's what m m if we think of i mean most architects think that architecture is everything that everywhere we go there's architecture so if we think of it that way we should we should also say well all of these spaces that are not high architecture are not they're as important because that's where people form their identities that's where people experience social relations and they experience those social relations because of the walls that are around them because of the way that these walls are 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 um uh, doing something to their memories doing something to their 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 experiences so so i think that's kind of um it it took a long time, but that's the kind of thinking about uh, or the, the awakening of why I think about queer spaces. Uh, that's where it came from. Yeah. And um, I, th I think kind of another thing that that is, is also interesting, and, and, and that comes a lot from from you, uh, but from also from some other mentors. That it, it's also this idea of thinking about architecture as something again that is more than technical and. I, I keep talking with my students about a quote that you have in one of, of your study of, of Ellen Gray's E1027, when you, you say that you have a cross on Ellen Gray's and, and that's, that's kind of how you, you came to work on it. And that it's really important for you to point that out, that you have this this kind of these feelings and these emotions for, for someone that I'm guessing you never met, but but that is kind of someone that, that is there in, in your, um, uh, in your experience of our, of our work. So while many architects and historians say that like, okay, I appreciate this person's work, but they really straightforwardly say that they have a crush on these people. So I want to hear you kind of talk about how, why you started thinking about this and kind of say, okay, I need to be explicit about, I have a crush on Ellen Gray and how has this been received by others? Mm. Yeah, that's so fun because, of course, I write out of a kind of feminist, queer feminist positioning, you know, because I I want to position myself in the text. I want to out myself somehow that I, mm, this is so, I mean, you know, I I do this because I, uh, I'm intrigued by her and her, uh, the work that she did, you know, so, and it's also a way of making her present in our time that it's not, you know, it kind of pulls her into, into our uh, contemporary. Uh, and of course, I mean, the underlying thing about it is that it's, I'm, no one is objected. Uh, the whole, the feminist like ontology that we need to continuously underline that there's no such thing as an objective view. And by just saying that I have a crush on this person, then, you know, no one can accuse me for being objective, you know. And it's actually been really well received. I think uh, I've there's been so much. I mean, I've had so much many people coming up to me saying how they've been inspired by that, and I've been that's been so uh, fantastic. And for me, you know, it's such an endeavor to write a PhD, and I was like, oh, is anyone going to read this, you know? And then. You know, this is a long time ago, and you can. I mean, it's still being downloaded. Yeah, I should say that it's it's open access. You can download it for free. Uh, so it's like, yeah, it's living its own life, and it's just so you know, it's such a wonderful uh, experience for for me as the one who, who put the writing into or the, put the words into writing. Uh, and and also, I've been thinking about. Of course, there are people who you know you get crit criticism, and there are people who are homophobic or misogynic or so on. But if I start to respond to that, then I just end up being like a you know. You can always. Be, there's so. I mean, I, I'm leaning towards Ikosovsky Sedgwick here. You know about the paranoia. If you keep on, like responding to that you get paranoid you know and you the only thing you can do is kind of defend yourself and so i'm much more into the idea of, of acting out of, of the reparative 
like like the way if Kosovsky Sedgwick described this. I'm sorry for everyone who doesn't know about these texts by Ivo Kosovsky Sedgwick. Um, you should check her out because this writing is fantastic. She writes about the paranoia that comes out of being constantly criticized. Of, uh, and of course, we should have criticism. Critical theory is super important. We should criticize the ones in power and all that. But it's also a position which is really tricky to work from because if you do only do that, then you become paranoid. So what she suggests is that we should, should could work out of, of, uh, of the touch, things that touches us, the feeling. Uh, the book is called, uh, uh, no, um, what's it called? Um, sorry, no, I, I lost it just because I'm gonna, well, I was gonna be didactic. Oh, um, okay, so, uh, I'll come back to that. But anyway, you, you will find it um, touch and equals of the centric. Anyway, so she talks about the, the reparative and how we need to work with with care and, and so on rather than with paranoia. So I try to stay with the, that is much more productive for me anyway, and also for the way we work in Mika. Touching feeling, thank you so much, Jan. Uh, phew. Uh, which is also then of course connected to the queer, like who is touchy, who is feely, yeah, it's the it's the queer boy or it's the young girl, uh, and who can accuse someone of being touchy? You know, that's also a really super strong power relation, and uh, and I think we really need to take care of our sensitivities and and depart from our sensitivities when we when we do things because we know in our body when something is not right, and that's where we should start working. And as architects and our designer, arch artists, whatever we call ourselves, people in spatial production, we should really, really be careful about that because we know if something looks like a prison or if it's actually done with care. Uh, so Olivier, I think we are, we're talking so much and maybe we should let the audience in, but I have one more question I really want to pose to you and it's about the future. Yeah. Like where, where, what world do you want? Where do you want us to go yeah. now? What yeah. should we do? <laughs> and I, I think, yeah. Yeah. no, this is, a, the, this is a great question in the sense that I, and especially like I, I, I'm thinking of it in terms of kind of the, the queer work that we're doing and kind of is there, is there a reason why we're doing this and we're kind of talking about this and, and in a way I see two answers possible and, and one of them is well, so, so as I said, I, I've kind of been always involved in organizations in, in, in Montreal and elsewhere. And when we, we, we recently celebrated our 25th anniversary of one of these organizations, the question is always, kind of, oh, where do you see yourself? Where do you see the organization in, in, in 25 years? And we also say, well, we, we hope we won't be there anymore because we hope we won't need to do this work and we not, won't need to do talk about this. And, and this is kind of a bit what, what I see sometimes when I when I uh, present some of ide these ideas and especially ta talking about queer domesticity is often kind of people will say, well, what you're talking about is is basically what everyone is experiencing. And I say, oh, you ex you got it exactly right, where I'm using queer thinking to point out some things, but that are not specifically lived just by people who's sexual orientation or gender identity doesn't fit within within the norm it's kind of the, it, it, these questions that are it, it's just opening up these questions that can be helpful for everyone so so in a way to when people say oh well why don't we talk about it why do we talk about it because there, there's no reason to talk about it. it it fits but at the same time i think i think the discussions are important and you were just talking about in in your previous answer about kind of the the subjective and kind of the, the fact that we we need to realize that um, architecture is not something that is neutral. And often the other answer that I get, for example, from my students is that, um, well, there is one truth about how we should think about these spaces. And you, you can't you, like you can't say these things because they're not the one truth that that exists. And that's where I kind of see the, the work that I'm doing as as someone that thinks about queer, queerness and, 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 and spatial uh, uh, production as being about kind of really um, hoping that more people will understand how deeply 
uh, related our our self or collect of collective and self identities um, or sense of collective and self identities tied to the way that we experience, but also the way that we design, and that that kind of that's where I see things going. But but I think that being said. I think that we're really going in a wonderful direction. I, I'm, I'm really an optimist by nature. So even though I see many things that are not that that happy around, at the same time, I, I hear I hear discussions. I talk with students. I talk with with friends. I talk with with people, and I see um, a, a need felt by many people to kind of recognize that diversity of, of feelings and emotions about about uh, architecture, about space. And I think that that's a great thing. So, yeah. And I, 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 I think just before we move into other questions, how do you see the future? What do you really? Do, what do you <laughs> uh, I want to underline the last thing you said about the idea of, of you know, respect towards diversity. That we can see a much more vary, much more, many, much more variation. You know that, and a, a little less of this. Uh, you know, being stuck in, in a system that could, I mean, talking about architecture now, you know, being stuck in a productive system that is super capitalist, that it's super, you know, that's all about counting the hours and so on. And just like, no, 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 we have to learn how to live with the planet, not on top of the planet. And we have to use everything we know. And I think that coming from the queer perspective, or everything with the queer theory and so on, it's so embodied, it's so much mm -hmm. out of a, out of a, like, I think that those theories are so important because they are felt. Uh, and I think that is super fun, like a really good departure to actually be able to do this big change in system that we need to do now. And I think queers, creatures of all sorts, we just need to kind of grab hands and, and uh, you know, then the future is near. And I'm also like hopelessly optimistic. <laughs> no, <laughs> Which is, um, you know, because we need, I mean, that's that's just what I do, you know, and and uh, and we need to nurture each other in that. Uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those notes of optimism, I am. Um... Yeah. I would like to again invite um, anyone who's watching to feel free to drop a question into the comments. Um, we have about five or ten minutes left to, um, to take those, but while we wait, I can um, open with one that I have sort of been mulling over since the beginning of your talk, Olivia, and, and opening with such a kind of heavy um, member of the canon if you like in, in philip johnson and this idea of um both of you it feels like you've touched on these strategies of specifically working with kind of the idea of an architectural history and the fact that that is something that you need to engage with in this work but also something that in many ways is quite at odds with a lot of its ideas especially around these ideas of um authorship or this idea of simultaneously having the, the need for queer heroes in architecture, but also almost a desire to pull away from thinking that way about architectural figures, if you like. And Katerina, I think the whole, for me, the having a crush on Eileen Gray sort of immediately does something to deflate that notion of the um, inaccessible architectural mm -hmm. hero. As you say, it kind of pulls her uh, into the present. I wondered, you know, in your roles as researchers and to some degrees educators as well, how, what are some of the strategies you use for dealing with uh, the conventional structures of architectural history, if you like, and how we tell those stories? How, how do you kind of bring queer critique to bear on those in a way that lets you uh, interpret those histories, but also avoid falling into some of the traps that exist within them. Yeah, um, maybe I, I can start and, and just by saying that this is what I've what I found. So I haven't been teaching for, for many years, but, but what I've really found is that students want to hear those non-canonical histories and they're, they're like, they're just, 
fed up of hearing the, the same the same few people over and over again. So I've been really kind of working hard to do this. But at the same time, as you say, there's there's um, a challenge because you we tell stories of what we know so for for kind of as a university professor obviously i have access to many different sources but i'm also stuck to those existing sources and and so to kind of go around it so one of the strategies that i've been using in, is instead of kind of looking at history as something chronological and kind of something that okay we move from this this um this movement to this other movement that kind of reacts to it so I, I present that in one day at the beginning of the semester to students and say, okay, this is the history of the 20th century in, in 90 minutes. And then we'll just look at different spaces. We'll look at restrooms and public bath and kind of spaces where we clean our bodies. And we'll, we'll look at some of these spaces that have been designed by these big names and some of them that have been just kind of emerging from, from people's experience. And I do this with the diff different typologies so that so that students kind of see, okay, these spaces fit within this, this canonical stories, but they're also being resisted. They're being challenged by, by people. They're being transformed by people that don't fit within the, these big names of it. And that's where I'm, I'm kind of able to also explain, okay, why do people try to resist those? Why do people try to tell other histories and kind of really explain to students why we do history and why we need to challenge these histories? And so that's kind of been my, my strategy right now to kind of frame that. And I think it's been successful in ways and kind of being really honest, I, as I said, I really need to find many more sources and there's always kind of a limit to what you can teach in a semester of, of, of class, for example. But the, that's one strategy that I've been doing and, and, and showing them also what you can do with this and kind of integrating that in the projects that they do so that they understand why you would, you might want to learn about these histories, but not why you need to kind of step outside of them. Mm. And in your talk, you also touched upon another strategy and that's to turn to other media than like yeah. the architecture history books. Like for instance, when I was teaching, I, I always used as a Wolf, the house in good taste as a really important <laughs> history book, you know, which is, you know, you kind of try to queer the canon in that sense. But also when we work now, we always use his history in a very active way. We look, look a lot at historical references, try to dig them out of the archives. And then, like for instance, we were working with a group of students at the Art Academy in Copenhagen, and we were looking at, queer, uh, club, at the club scene in Copenhagen, and the students went out to find various places and so on, and, and then we were going to do a um, full-scale enactment of some sorts. Then we found a, a bar called Amiralskroen, and the thing with that place was that it was kind of really super mixed place. It was gay, lesbian, straight, you know, and it was set in two apartments. And these two apartments was connected with a staircase. And the staircase was the place where everyone hung out. So if you, the straights were downstairs, the queers were upstairs, but in the staircase, you know, everybody was there. So the staircase was really the most queer space of that, uh, of the Amiral's Cohen. And then what we did with the students, we built an enormous, staircase over 100 square meters like an enormous like uh the full the full exhibition space became an, an enormous spiral staircase like a set of stages almost from floor to ceiling which kind of expanded that space from the inside kind of broke it loose because it be became twice as big you know you had a floor space but then you also had all these stages so it became a truly queer space and it had a reference in history with Amiraz and it told the history of Amiraz but our state case didn't look at all like this. Uh, it wasn't a replica at all. It was more a fantasy of hanging in the staircase at Amiraskuen. So we try to use history in a super active way. And in mm -hmm. that sense, it doesn't really, the canon doesn't really come in then, you know? It's more like we find something that's super interesting and then we try to make you know, an investigation about it. Um, we've had one. We've got a couple of questions, which I think we'll have time for with quick answers, although they're tricky questions, so that's the challenge. Um, 
The first one, um, we've got Sarah Nasser suggests that a queer public space can involve glass that Olivier mentioned because you need privacy in public space. What do you see as, a, as um, design features of a queer space? Um, do you want to start? Yeah, I start. <laughs> okay, okay I, want to throw in, I want to throw in Paris as an example. Because the the gay the men gay bars in Paris they have like the glass they're open, uh, but the the lesbian bars they have uh, covered windows because of the kind of climate uh, lesbian and, and uh, gay men culture has in Paris. So they have very different responses in relation to the situation. I would say. Yeah, and this is a very tricky question. Actually, that's that's the one that. That's why I did my PhD in a way, because I wanted to kind of look at, at are there design features? And, and in a way, what, what I've kind of started to realize is that it's, it's really hard. So, so there's kind of, for example, when I was looking at queer domesticity, there was all of these challenges to, to private and public. And then I looked at a project that was kind of, that was kind of embodying the, or framing this as Okay, we'll just create houses that are have these glass walls, and that's that's all because because there is kind of this this connection between the two. But if you start looking like it wasn't a very dense space, and if you start thinking about it, who can actually have these kind of, of glass walls and and feel protected? You need to have some kind of, of privilege and, and access to to these spaces. So so I, it it becomes really tricky when you start for me when you start trying to um pinpoint kind of specific things about what is a design feature of queer space because i think it's much more helpful to think about a queer way of experiencing those space a queer way of understanding those spaces and of asking questions of those space then really kind of it, because as soon as you start saying oh this is a, a a queer characteristic of a space then you'll find a counter example that really shows how it's not queer at all so so it, it raises a lot of uh, of questions but, but i mean i've i've worked on this for 15 years almost 15 years now so so really it's a good question <laughs> but, but, I, it, but also it, i mean i totally agree with you olivia but on the other hand there's also lots of symbolic meanings invested yeah, in yeah. and like the aesthetics is super important so it's mm -hmm. not that it's not important but it actually travels you know it's yeah. really mm -hmm. dependent on the situation and but it's it's like in each and every situation there are these signs that are important, mm -hmm. and then of course it needs to be queer, it needs to keep on moving because it's we live in the super capitalist yeah. era, so everything that is sellable suddenly gets eaten, yeah. so it moves all the time. But of course, there are queer features, queer aesthetics. Um, and our final question. Um, why did you decide to focus particularly on architecture pedagogical issues after studying queer spaces in general? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, one of one of the reasons for me was that I was looking at queer spaces and I was looking at uh, people who had been talking about queer spaces for since the early 1990s. And then when I started my PhD in 2010, I felt, okay, this has been part of the conversation for 20 years and i see nothing anywhere like not nothing but there's very few traces of that that thinking that has been part of it and i figured okay there's a reason there there is probably a reason why it's just that it hasn't really become or transformed the way that we teach about design it hasn't really transformed the way that that we think about how we um yeah, how we share that knowledge and how we share knowledge that that is not kind of the one that that has just been transmitted forever so that that's kind of why in my case i kind of shifted to thinking about okay what what are some of these pedagogies that have existed in in architectural education and how can we queer them how can we use and especially i i often talk about queer and feminist pedagogies of space because i i think they're they're really close they, there's differences, but they're really close in, in kind of how they challenge the way that we've been uh, teaching architecture. And for me, that's the only way that we'll be able to to um, get to some of the, the things that we've been discussing uh, today. So. Thank you very much. Well, if there are no um, 
final comments. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Katerina. And thank you very much, everyone, um, for joining us. And as I say, How We Live Now is open in the Barbican foyers until Christmas. So do head down and have a look if you can. Uh, and keep an eye out for more events between now and then as well. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you.